Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Julia Kim. Coming up on the show this week. Will the truce in Yemen lead to the end of what's been described as the world's worst humanitarian crisis? We'll have more with our guest just coming up shortly. Also in today's programme, we'll tell you why thousands of Lebanese migrants see Iraq as a land of opportunity. And shattering stereotypes, Egyptian comedy sees women take to the stage for the country's first all-female stand-up show. Now, the first day of Ramadan brought the unthinkable to Yemen, the start of a two-month truce. But a few days in, warring sides have already traded accusations of ceasefire violations. Nonetheless, this fragile truce offers the best hope in years for ending what the UN has called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Now in its eighth year, the war in Yemen has killed nearly 400,000 people, with millions on the brink of famine. The Red Sea port of Hodeida, controlled by the Houthis, has been a key battleground in Yemen's civil war. A limited number of shipments of oil and other supplies are once again arriving here after Houthi rebels and a Saudi-led coalition agreed to halt all military offensives for two months. A respite for Yemenis at the start of Ramadan. What we've been suffering from the most is the Saudi blockade, which besieges us and prevents us from accessing oil, food and many other things. However, hopes that the ceasefire will hold have dampened as both sides accuse the other of violations. Yemen's foreign minister tweeted, The truce has been greatly welcomed, but it is threatened by the Houthis' breaches, including military deployments, mobilization of troops and vehicles, artillery and drone strikes. Houthi media channels also reported alleged breaches by pro-government troops. The conflict, which began in 2014 when the Iran-backed Houthis overran the capital, morphed into a proxy war after Saudi Arabia and other Gulf powers intervened the next year. Since then, the economy has halved in what was already one of the world's poorest nations. Half the population has been pushed to the brink of famine. The war has fueled one of the world's most worst humanitarian crises brought state institutions to the verge of collapse, reversed human development by two decades, and threatened regional peace and security. Speaking from Riyadh, Yemeni President Abid Rabu Mansur Hadi has called on the Houthis to return to the negotiating table. Well, joining us on the program today is Senior Research Fellow at Oxford University, Dr. Elizabeth Kendall. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Firstly, do you think this truce will last, given that there have already been accusations of ceasefire violations? Well, we have to hope that it will last, but experience does show that these kinds of truces are tougher to implement than they are to agree. They've come and gone before. There was a short-lived nationwide truce in 2016. There was another ceasefire in 2018 based on the Stockholm Agreement. That was only for one area of Yemen. And that was marred by hundreds of violations and never really came to anything. I think, though, that peace has to start somewhere. There are some positive signs with the arrival of the first fuel ships into Hodeida port, but it won't be easy. And, and we certainly shouldn't be complacent. I'd say cautious optimism. Don't forget there are about 50 active war fronts in Yemen and cycles of revenge are in place. It may be hard for the powers that be to control their forces on the ground. As you say, there have already been clashes and violations. Let's hope that that's simply the ceasefire bedding in and not symptomatic of a broader unravelling of the truce. So cautious optimism. And you also mentioned that these fuel ships that have arrived in the uh, port city of Hodeida. Just how significant is that development? This is significant because it's a development that the UN Special Envoy, the international community, and most of all the Yemenis on the ground have been pressing for, for months, indeed years. So it does make a huge difference to life on the ground. The fuel ships, they're not just for, for petrol, for people's cars, they power water pumps, they power electricity generators, and they're essential for the aid and the food to be distributed around Yemen. So that's a really good sign. Now, you mentioned it is the holy month of Ramadan, but why do you think this truce was called now? I mean, is it just Ramadan or are there other factors at play? In terms of the players in the war itself, both of them are really aligned right now in wanting uh, to ease off 
on the armed conflict because on the coalition side, there's been a big increase in Houthi missiles outside Yemen's borders into Saudi Arabia and also latterly into the United Arab Emirates. So they're very much wanting a ceasefire. And on the Houthi side, they've been trying to take Marib for over a year and they haven't succeeded. They've been pushed back in another southern, southern governorate called uh, Shabwa. And it's increasingly hard for them to survive with the blockade. Of course, the Houthis do still hold territory in which around two thirds of the population lives. So they're in a reasonably good position to enter into some kind of political process which the truce might usher in. And, and I think it's worth mentioning, as in your introduction, that the war is entering its eighth year. There's a fatigue about it. There's a realisation now that there are no winners and that there is no military solution. And just finally, what would stability in Yemen mean for the region as a whole, especially in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine? Well, there will be positive knock-on effects for the whole region. I hope that this will lead to some kind of further rapprochement between Iran and the Gulf states. And it also removes a contentious issue that's proven rather awkward for relations between the Saudi-led coalition and its Western allies. And then, of course, allows the the great powers to focus on trying to resolve that issue in Ukraine. Uh, it releases the bandwidth for that. And we must mention also that there are predictions that around 19 million Yemenis will be hungry on the brink of starvation by the end of this year. And of course, about 40 percent of Yemen's imports of wheat come from Ukraine and Russia. So I think that solving this war now is incredibly important to stave off an, a de, a, an escalation and also a massive spiralling of the humanitarian crisis. OK, Elizabeth Kendall, thank you very much for your time on Middle East Matters. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Now, Iraq is emerging as a new land of opportunity for the Lebanese. Authorities in Baghdad say more than 20,000 immigrated in the past year, mainly to work in the health and service sectors. Iraq has returned to relative stability after defeating the Islamic State group back in 2017. Meanwhile, Lebanon is currently in the throes of an unprecedented economic crisis. James Mulholland has the story. Akram is a restaurant manager in Baghdad. A year ago, in his home country, Lebanon, he could never have imagined that he would immigrate to Iraq in search of a better life. The 42-year-old now runs this restaurant in the heart of the Iraqi capital, but he still feels nostalgic about his old life. I bought a ticket and came to Baghdad. Here, my work allows me to support my family, something I couldn't do in Lebanon. Like Akram, more than 20,000 Lebanese workers have chosen to settle in Iraq in recent years. Since 2019, Lebanon's currency has plummeted further and further, and 80% of the population now lives under the poverty line. Since a claimed victory over the Islamic State organization in 2017, Iraq appears to have pulled off a relative return to stability. Lebanese companies in the tourism, hospitality and particularly the health sectors now see it as a land of opportunity. More than 900 new Lebanese businesses have set up shop in Iraq, like this optical center in Baghdad, which has been busy since the day it opened. People always ask me why I opened a branch in Iraq. In our center in Lebanon, we used to see many Iraqi patients. They trusted the Lebanese health system. Lebanese are not afraid to invest in Iraq, despite persisting security problems. That's down to several reasons, according to this economist. Some Lebanese investors feel that Iraq is a good environment to invest in. There is an abundance of liquidity, dynamic economic activity and a sense of security in the market. But it isn't only sunny skies. In a country where most income is generated by oil, 40 percent of young people are unemployed and one in three Iraqis live in poverty. As Lebanese immigrants see opportunity in Iraq, Thousands of Iraqis are looking outside for a new life.
Well, turning now to Egypt, where female comedians have taken to the stage for the country's first women-only stand-up show. Organised by women for women, they say the aim is to empower the fairer sex and challenge stereotypes. Catherine Kadir Clifford has this. They've got the crowds in fits. The work may be fun, but these women's goal is serious. To give Egyptian women a voice in comedy and to stand up to deep-rooted prejudice against female humour within Egyptian society. A woman is not expected to be funny, and when she does comedy, she's always put in a certain frame where if you just hinted at something sensitive and said your opinion and actually made people laugh, people would say this is not appropriate. But if a man said the same thing, it will be OK. Comedians Noha Kato, Reem Nabil, Bernadette and Sarah Abdul Rahman make up Egypt's first all-female stand-up comedy show, Comedy Set. They hope to establish a platform fully founded by women that supports the careers of comedians of both sexes. We're comedians. It has nothing to do with whether we're men or women. Everyone has their own character, their own life and problems that they talk about things that get their attention. Anyone who writes comedy actually does so from their point of view as a human being. The four hope their platform will empower more female performers as well as women who have learned to stifle their sense of humour in their daily lives. Some nine in ten Egyptian women have experienced sexual harassment or assault, according to the UN. Making more space for women's voices where they haven't been welcome the project's a step in the right direction to move away from objectification and the sexual violence this can lead to. Well, that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. There's more world news coming up here on France 24. Thanks for watching. Bienvenidos a las noticias de France 24. Thanks very much for joining us. And um, before... Hello, I'm Confi Thakafa, in the United States. I'm happy to meet you for Africa Hebdo in the program this week. We're going to listen to one another. This storm has hit New York City a lot. I pledge to be a president. Today's those who don't follow the Constitution. Maria Scarpa, 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 Your confidence means a lot to us. Muchas gracias. Shukran ala hadhi al-thiqa. Thank you. Merci du fond de mon cœur. Liberté, égalité, actualité.